We're good? Cool. OK, so just before we jump into the discussion, we'll talk a bit about the, uh, the results and just how they kind of explored their hyperparameters. So there's only two, so this will be pretty quick. So the first we have is lambda, which is our regularization term. And uh, generally, they found that the smaller they made lambda, the better their result. And the way they tested that was basically just grid search over a single variable. So just set a value, run it for a, some number of iterations, and see where it goes. They also took their best value, which was 0 0.065 and ran it for 50 iterations just to see if it kept decreasing. But at around 50 iterations, they were getting a very, very small improvement in performance, close to 0 0.001. And next, similarly, for uh, the, the number of factors, or the number of hidden features. So basically, given a set lambda, they would just increase the number of hidden features to see how the improvement went, and generally, the more you add, the better it performs, but you lose some of the, the computational uh, benefit of a smaller number. And so just a list of their experimental results. So their best result overall was uh, using 1,000 hidden features and a lambda of 0 0.065 that yielded them a 0 0.8985 root mean squared error. And they didn't do any of their, uh, their post-processing on this result. They didn't do the, the linear shift that we talked about earlier. And just to kind of compare where that stacks up against some of the, the top Netflix Prize winners, this is around a 0. Uh, around a 5.6% improvement over uh, Netflix's score. So compared to the 10.6% improvement that we see in first place, it's not quite there. But it's worth noting that this is a single model. It's just one approach, whereas all of the top performers in the Netflix Prize were ensembles of hundreds of models using a lot of different techniques. And uh, they also tried a couple uh, runs with uh, a combination of a couple other techniques, uh, one being restricted Boltzmann machines and the other being k-nearest neighbors, which are both approaches that have been tried and true in recommendation engines. And that provided a little bit of a boost on their best REMSE, uh, getting about 0 0.8952, a 5.91% increase over Cinematch. And that was with um, a K for their K nearest neighbor set to 21. And they don't describe anything about the number of hidden features in the restricted Boltzmann machine, so I can't really speak to that. So from there, we'll get into the discussion points. So if anybody has any questions now that they've come up with, or we can start with these. Uh, one of the ones that they mention is they just select root mean squared error as their objective function. They don't really talk about why. So one of the questions we wanted to ask is why, what else could they have used? What are some other approaches? And how do you consider, is it, is it OK to just say that this is the most appropriate? Or is there something else that we can consider? This was a question that Serena brought up as well. So any thoughts? Do we have actually an actual question? I was not sure. I, I think it's more so like, yeah, given, given this kind of problem, what other available error functions would be useful or, or just an error. provide some benefit? Yeah. Their loss function, they, they, in the paper, they explicitly say, like, this is the most appropriate. And our question is, why is it most appropriate? Well, <clears throat> it depends if your goal is, like, if you want to minimize the number of movies that your, your users hate, maybe you want a loss function that's more weighted, like, the, that gives you a higher penalty if you end up giving a movie like a high rating when someone like would have otherwise given it a low rating. Mm -hmm. So like it depends what their what their objective is. Like mm -hmm. what is it ultimately Netflix's metric is going to be probably engagement. Like mm -hmm. does this person actually start rewatching? So what loss function best captures that? Yeah, in a, in a production context, you're right. It, there's a lot of other questions to ask where for the contest the rule was strictly get the RMSE as low as you can. Granted the the reason they used RMSE is that was the measure, but what other loss functions could they use in a production context? There's a lot more questions to ask around it. You're right. That's a good point. Um, another loss function that I've seen used with the ALS is uh, like a ranking based. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, expected percentile, right? Uh, I don't remember. Uh, what the it's position. Uh, so okay. essentially, you, you run your algo and whatever and rank the items and then compare to uh, the the ground truth and mm -hmm. see, you know, how many of the, your top five is in your top five sort of thing. Yeah, the 2012 paper that Corin, who 
was part of the winning submission, winning team for the Netflix prize. Um, they talk about implicit feedback for collaborative filtering systems, and they use a metric that they call um, expected percentile rank, which is pretty much what you just described, but they just name it as such. And apparently it has been used up until now, but like um, in a couple of papers that I read about recommended systems, especially about like movies and retail, like high-end fashion where it's very um, famous, I guess, um, they, they t always try to compare the position of a item I, for example, in the two different algorithm and see um, how it got different, um, which is, again, I think it's, uh, it's a very similar to the yeah. idea that you just said. So that's another um, loss function that can come up with. Another thing that is not really a loss function, but it's another approach to this kind of filtering problem has been to, especially since these days, neural nets are very uh, uh, popular. Um, the function that you are approximating here is the right combination, weighted multiplication of these two unknown latent variables. So basically you are approximating a multiplication matrix in a high dimensional space. And we know that neural nets can approximate based on the theorem, that uh, um, global uh, approximation theorem, they can approximate any function given enough uh, number of nodes, even with just one hidden layer. So recently it has been proved that you can, actually I, I'm not aware of any paper that they exceeded methods such as matrix factorization, but you can get to the same level of accuracy using neural nets. Now the advantage over there is that it's quite easy to if you have this kind of data and you want to combine it with other type of inputs, so say the images of the, of the movie that you can feed into a CNN and get the latent variable from that, then you can easily merge a few different modes of data. So that, although the, the, mm, the not network itself is not gonna increase your accuracy, uh, or not significantly, but it gives you a way of working with other types of data easier. So that, that in general, might be a kind of like a better approach to solving this problem. A paper that was using that exact what you just described is uh, it's called the, the approach is called Dropout Net, and it was the winner of the 2017 Rexis competition. It's a very interesting paper. If anybody hasn't read it, it's very good. And uh, another point. Um, The nice thing about the that kind of implementation where you're mixing different types of content is you can split the user network essentially and the item network across different machines. So you can have them spread across different compute because all you really need is the top level activation of both networks that you use to take your dot product and get your rating. So training uh, is obviously it takes a fair amount of time because it's a big neural net, especially if you're using something like images or movies or text even. But um, inference is very fast, and training can be split across the two networks. And uh, moving into our second discussion point, I suppose, um, one of the questions that, and this might just be my lack of understanding or lack of math background, but one of the things that they say is the regularization term and the, the Chikhanov matrices that they select uh, empirically never overfit. And they, that's a statement that I don't think they exactly throw out, just kind of oh, Actually, they, they said clearly, e like, it never overfits by either increasing the number of features or increasing the number of iterations. And it got us thinking, is it going to overfit if we increase both, both at the same time, which they didn't mention at all. And in fact, that one of their very clear statements is we use chicken off because it never overfits over like other kind of uh, regularization. So that's one of the statements that we never understood exactly what did they mean by it. So Even in their conclusion back in 2008, they said we'd like to explore a, an analytical reason why this behaves this way. So even they were a little confused as to why their experiments were showing these results. This 
This kind of regularization was also particularly related to this alternating way of optimization because to me it seems that otherwise you just use L2 norm as your re regularizer. To separate it to two different parts, it seems that it should be related to that alternating. I think it's more so that it's, it's the, the common regularization for least square, linear least squares problems. Because that's what they're solving for each update, so they just went with what was standard. I think um, part of their observation was just the selection, what they chose to be those matrices that they scaled by, which was the, the number of movies a user had rated and the number of items, or the number of ratings a particular movie had. I think that was, the, it was the selection of those values that gave them those results. So Omar's concern was they just got lucky with a, a heuristic value, essentially, and they just kind of struck gold. But we're wondering if there's a more... Uh, a more well thought out reason for it, but yeah, tough question. Yeah, one reason why we sort of came to this conclusion that they just got lucky is that in the paper, I should turn it in the paper when you're reading through it, it doesn't really start out and say we're going to come up with a single method that's going to be great and groundbreaking. They sort of it sort of seems clear that they're going about to win the Netflix prize and then they end up failing and then they go back. It's as if they went back and said, hey, but we can highlight that this is the best okay. single model method that worked for this problem. So yeah, we sort of wondered what were they, what was really going on there? Were they just lucky, maybe a bit unlucky? It, this, this, this approach got very popular at yeah, that time, yeah. right? Yeah. It did. So it's yeah. not just luck, I don't yeah. think so. No, but <laughs> I think our point was, first of all, again, they a lot of parts in the paper where they never explained, like they said, okay, there's a lot of noise in the matrix, and we just remove the noise from the signal. That's it. And we process the signal with no any explanation on how they did that. Well, it is a very complicated process. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. The second thing, um, like as we saw in the paper, like there's a post-processing, which is kind of, and that was uh, Serena's question. Why, why didn't they pre-process the data before? Why isn't it post-process? And maybe it's not the right answer, but the only thing I might come up with is they started tweaking the results trying to get the best model that they have, but it's not the optimum solution eventually. That's why we came up with these kind of conclusion because mm -hmm. there's a lot of missing things from the paper. Yeah, and they also, this is nitpicking a bit, but they, when they use Canon, they say, with an appropriate similarity metric, KNN can be quite useful, and then they go on to not say what that similarity metric is. So there's sort of these missing pieces in the paper at times. Yeah. I don't mind reaction was to point a laser at it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess as a last discussion question, I'm interested if anybody in the audience has had experience with recommender systems? So yeah, the answer is yes, but what cool new methods have you been applying to your problems, if any? I don't want to put anyone on the spot, though. But Has <laughs> everyone used start. Spark's MLlib ALS implementation? <laughs> <laughs> well, just to start up, I'm trying um, different deep learning and reinforcement learning approaches on my uh, recommender system project. Or project. Um, nothing clear yet, but from what I feel, session-based recommendation is something that is striking up and it's uh, getting very good results recently. Um, and deep learning session-based has been implemented by one paper and they got very good results, but no one has been able to, got, to get something like that again. So that's one thing that I, I feel session-based definitely, deep learning approaches might do something in the future, yes. Yeah. About sessions, um, mm -hmm. that kind of approach is not applicable to this problem not because this. these are not sequential. Exactly. So with the session data. base, first of all, you need a lot of implicit and explicit data, not only explicit. This is the data set that they gave here is literally only the rating, user, movies, right. and the data set, right. which is not applicable for session based, right? right. Um, for session based, you need a lot of implicit data, like the number of views, the the, the, the time that each user yeah. viewed a product, right? So that's something different than this um, um, domain, um, but something for like in retail. Right? It's a very common and very useful way because you want to see which product had the most views but maybe it didn't have a lot of pushes, so there's something going on with that. Um, for these kind of um, 
domain um, have that capability of getting fashion-based approaches. Yes. One note on the, the deep learning approaches, back to dropout net, which we were talking about, or any kind of method that combines that, that latent representation and content. It's these kind of matrix factorization algorithms that build into that, because to feed that network that data, you still need to factorize your matrix. And this would be a great technique to pretty efficiently create that part of your model. Because it is a. Actually have, sorry. Uh, people ahead. actually have used these matrices as like the first layer, as like a, um, basically starting with this and then fine tuning Correct. on top of it. Yeah. So that's also something. Oh. Just to add to that, <clears throat> so basically, when we do it in Canadian data, it's basically we take ALS results, and then we have another neural network which is basically rating what's the rating that you go and buy this product in the next week. Mm -hmm. So that added to the features mm -hmm. because we don't have movie ratings, we have like users and products they buy. Another thing we add to it says flyers. So all the detail they sell on flyers. So best challenge flyers. So we say. This kind of product in the flyer will drive the most views in that week. So that also goes into the system. So kind of that, plus a feedback loop which we have, which is based on your past offers, what is your feedback on those offers? So if you don't like that offer for two weeks in a row, that doesn't mean, that it doesn't make sense that we give a high rating to that one. So we train that and we put the rating down for that. Based on it. Hi everybody, welcome to TDLS. I'm Lindsay, I'm one of the members of the steering committee. If you liked the video you just saw, subscribe to our YouTube channel and you'll be the first to find out about every video we put out.